With her, let us come before the Lord and ask for his help now as we come to his word. Father, we think on those words in that hymn, it passes knowledge. And Lord, it passes knowledge. That dear love of thine. Lord, we don't understand your love. Your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. You are above us. You are transcendent. We are the creature. You are the creator. And yet, Father, in some mysterious way we are able to know you you reveal yourself to us and we know what the mystery is we know Lord that you have revealed yourself by your word you have revealed yourself by your only begotten the Lord Jesus Christ and we get to know you we get to see you face to face through him by your Holy Spirit. And we come to you now, Lord, as those words say, though we cannot sing, though we cannot know, though we cannot tell the richness of thy love, an empty vessel we bring. Father, we ask that you will fill us. Fill us, Lord, with your love. Fill us, Lord, with your knowledge, with your wisdom, with your spirit with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Help us to know, Lord, that every step we take, Christ is there looking over us. The good steps, the sinful steps, O oh Lord my God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon us this morning and fill us. Lord, we pray that you will meet us today, Lord, in the circumstances of our life, wherever we may be, we thank thee, Heavenly Father, that on the, the resurrection day, the Lord Jesus came and met with his disciples who were in fear, who had tempests in their souls, who had doubts. He came, he sat, he sucked, he filled. And we pray that this Sunday, Lord, resurrect us again set us upon our feet. So Lord, be with us, we pray, as we turn to your word. May your Holy Spirit be with us, guide us, open our hearts and ears, and bless us. Heavenly Father, praise ye the Lord. Praise you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we ask your blessing. Amen. So with that, <clears throat> We are just going to be touching on Revelation 18. We opened with Psalm 113 and Psalm 112. Uh, very good. Two Psalms in one, one week. I like that. That's good. Maybe that's a new way to go. And within Psalm 112, praise ye the Lord, praise ye the man who fears the Lord. The whole concept of the Psalm is about stewarding, being a good steward being a good steward under a covenant. And as we come to Revelation 18, we saw last week how there is the announcement from verse 2, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And I am taking Babylon to be apostate Israel in the first century. They have become like the nations. Who do you want? Do you want the murderer, says Pilate, or do you want your Messiah? We'll take him, crucify the Messiah. Jesus' entire ministry is walking around Israel, casting out demons, healing the sick, proclaiming, repent. Proclaiming, turn to me, come to me. His whole Beatitudes is him up on a mountain. And he is preaching, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the persecuted. In other words, you have God in flesh doing exactly what happened in the Old Testament when Moses is up a mountain meeting with God and he is getting the commandments to come down to the people to say to them, this is how you live your best life. 
And Jesus is there on a mountainside and he is there saying, this is how you live your best life. This is what the commandments really mean. You will grow and you will flourish the best when you are following me. Who do you want? Some people believed and became Christians. Some people didn't. Crucify him. And the harshest words that Christ had were not for sinners, the alcoholics, the gamblers, the prostitutes. They were for the religious leaders. You brood of vipers, you are leading people astray. And your entire Old Testament has this theme about the bigwigs, the leaders rising up, getting a nice, comfortable position and then stopping and going, has God really said? No, he hasn't. In fact, let's manipulate this here. Let's manipulate the law. In fact, don't worry about this. We can, we can have other gods. In fact, Yahweh isn't the only way to be saved. And time and time again in your Old Testament, you see this repeated over and over and over again. A new king comes. Most of them aren't good. They disobey the Lord. The Lord raises up a prophet to go and say, repent, you are not doing what you're supposed to be doing. The shepherds, those who are supposed to be intercessors, those who are supposed to be praying for the people, those who are supposed to be ministering the word of God to the people, they are rebuked time and time and time again in your old covenant, in your old testament. And you find that when you get to Revelation 18, that fallen, fallen is Babylon, Jerusalem, who rejects their Messiah, has become so hard-hearted that she gets called Babylon. She gets called an abomination. And we covered this last week, where it is, come out of her, my people, verse 4, come out of her. And we are going to read from verse 8 to the end of verse 24 this morning of chapter 18. I am going to give a, a little bit of background on a few verses, but I really want us this morning to spend some time on verses 20 to 24. And it's going to feel a bit repetitive. Because I'm saying to you that the book of Revelation, in its first principles, is about the end of the Old Covenant order. It's about the end of the Old Covenant. And we're going to see this morning, I hope, a moving from old to new. From old to new. And if you were to ask me for a title this morning, I would label this sermon, Casting Sin into the Sea. Casting Sin into the Sea. And we are going to do some biblical theology when we come to it. And then I'm going to break it down into three points of application for us on the hope that we can have this morning. So from verse 8 through to 24. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. All the kings of the land who have committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand off in fear of her torment and they will say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the land weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, in other words, everything. And then we get in slaves. That is human souls or human lives. 
the fruit for which your soul has longed and has gone from you. And all your delicacies and your splendors, they are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning, what city was like the great city. And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the land and all nations were deceived by your sorcery, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints, and of all have been slain on the land. Our text this morning is one that is quite heavy. It is one about sin. It is one where there is a character being spoken about, fallen, fallen is Babylon, and she is described here in language that is about beauty and luxury, the great city. She was the one, one who thought she was beautiful, thought she was everything, but turned out to actually be a false bride. Someone who thought they had everything but actually ended up with nothing. And last week I covered this talking about, and the week before talking about, Jezebel. Jezebel, the queen, married to King Ahab. A queen who's like, I am the chosen. I am the one who can weave all sorts of things. And she ends up being destroyed. And within all of the language that you have here, all of it is Old Testament language. Everything is pulled from the Old Testament here and woven into this canvas to say there is one who is wealthy, one who sits and says, I am the great one. And the challenge that you and I have when thinking about Jerusalem is we're not talking about her being mighty in terms of an army. She is mighty because she was the center of the world. When Solomon became king, everyone came to visit him. The other surrounding nations went to him. Jerusalem was the center. It is where God dwelt. Everything about this language here is talking about one who is wealthy, who is beautiful, and yet has forgotten her husband. That is what this is about. This is about God the Father sending his only begotten son and saying one question to every single person. What will you do with my son? Crucify him. What do you want to do with my son? Kill him. 
May his blood be on us and our children. These things will come to pass on this generation. 40 years. And we have between the ascension and between AD 70, where the temple is destroyed and it is finished, the old covenant is finally gone. It is over. We have these passages telling us that there are people who gained wealth from Jerusalem. And they did. Your Old Testament has that. The kings of the other nations, they gained wisdom. They gained wealth, whether they were conquering them by sword or whether they were negotiating with them. Time and time again. And the key principle where we get to merchants and we get all this language intertwined is we find that actually we're talking as well about the religious leaders. We're talking about those who had some coins, some power, who were the ones who all the people looked up to and said, wow, if only I could be like that person. And Christ says, no, don't be like that person. Two men went up to a temple to pray, says the Lord. One, a religious leader, a Pharisee, standing by, and he says, I thank thee I'm not like this scumbag. I thank thee I'm not like this one. Sinner, wretch, I tithe, I do this, I do this. And Christ says, that, that one there is lost. You see that sinner over there who can't even make his way up to the temple? Who just bows down and beats on his breast, God have mercy on me, a sinner? That one goes away righteous. That one goes away righteous, not this man. And within the whole concept of the Gospels, and we're going to go there in a second, because I really want us to focus on verses 20 to 24 this morning. We find Jesus going into the temple to cleanse it. He goes into the temple and says, You lot have caused my father's house to become what? A den of robbers. You lot are wheeling and dealing in the father's house. You are making money. You are robbing the poor. You are stealing. You're not praying. You're not fasting. You're not reading the word. And he condemns the temple. And he condemns the mountain. And I want us just to think, before we go into the three points of application that I have for us this morning, right from the get-go in Genesis, when the Lord sets up the Garden of Eden, there are four rivers that run out of the garden. And the Lord picks up Adam and he puts him into the garden. And it says the water flows down. Which means that the garden is somewhere on high. The Garden of Eden is not over the entire world. The Garden of Eden is a sacred space that the Lord created as a tabernacle. And he picks Adam up from the ground and he puts him into this sacred space. And he says, keep what's in the garden. And it's on a mountainside. And I want us to understand this this morning. Because the key for us to understand is we're going to look at a passage from Matthew that talks about Casting things into the sea. And we're going to see that he talks about a mountain being cast into the sea. And your entire Old Testament has everything about mountains, hilltops. The Garden of Eden is on a mountain. The Old Covenant, Moses goes up a mountain. Jesus preaches on top of the mountain. Mountains are quite important. Mountains is where worship happens. Elijah, when he's facing Jezebel and her false prophets, is on a mountain. Mountains represent in your Bible where gods dwell. Mountains represent who you worship. 
And so we find from verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. And I am again taking the first century principles to be that here we see the Lord saying, Rejoice, saints, rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged in your favor against who? Against apostate Israel who wants to kill you all. And we see that in the book of Acts. We see that in the book of Acts. Stephen is the first martyr killed by who? By the Jewish leaders. Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. This morning, as we come to this, I'm talking about us, seeing how we need to cast our sin into the sea, but we are also seeing how we're moving from Old Testament to New, Old Covenant to New. And so if you will bear with me, just turn very briefly to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And it is of no coincidence that we are in the book of Revelation. And next week we're going to start seeing that there is a wedding that takes place. And in Matthew 22... You have the parable of the wedding feast. Yes. No coincidence. In Matthew chapter 21, you have the triumphal entry of Christ coming in on a donkey, riding in his king, and his first port of call to say, yes, the king is here, is to go where? To the temple. That's where the king goes, to the temple. He goes to see what the worship's like. And so you find from verse 12, I want from verse 12 through of Matthew 21. Jesus has ridden in on a donkey and he's there. And my first port of call is to go and inspect the worship. Not the army, not the working class man. Not the middle class man. I'm going to go see what the worship's like in this place. I'm king. How's the worship? From verse 12, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a house of robbers, a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus had done, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to Jesus, Do you hear what these things are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? In other words, to be childlike is to have a heart of joy and praise. And here you have the religious leaders not being childlike. They're being indignant, being hard-hearted. And leaving them, verse 17, Jesus went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. So he leaves. He's come to inspect. He has found the worship to be appalling. He's not happy. And he's there and he's casting out all of those money changers, everyone who is robbing the Lord of his glory, everyone who is seeking to do their own will. He has this battle with the scribes and the Pharisees and says, you need to be childlike, fellas. You need to come and worship and do it with the right heart. And what do we know they do? Crucify him. So he leaves. Verse 18 through. 
In the morning, as Jesus was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. Before we go any further, Jesus has just cleansed the temple. He leaves, he comes back in the morning and he's hungry and he goes to a fig tree and it has leaves on it. But no fruit. This is very important. Figs are always representing Jews throughout your Bible. I saw you, Philip, under the fig tree. Jeremiah chapter 24. The good figs are going into exile. The bad figs, they're staying where they are. And a fascinating line here. To go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Something fascinating about fruit bearing. When Adam and Eve sin in the Garden. Verse 7 of chapter 3 of Genesis. When their eyes were opened to the fact that they had sinned. And they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. In other words, Adam and Eve in the garden weren't bearing any fruit. They were told to keep the word of God and they didn't. So they have these leaves, but no fruit. And here we see Jesus walking through Jerusalem and he sees a fig tree and he says, you look like a tree that's bearing life. But where's the fruit? Where's the evidence? You've got no fruit. Where's the fruit? You just have leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. This is talking again in the bigger bigger plan of everything about the old covenant coming to an end. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you are the city. You are the people who slay the prophets. You're the one who stone those who are sent to you. You're going to kill me. And as a result, there'll be no more fruit coming. When his disciples saw this, verse 20, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them and said, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, and again, Jesus has ridden in, On a donkey, the king is here, he goes to the temple, which is on a mountain, and he says, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So many times this passage has been taken to mean, are you suffering? Have you prayed about it? Has it not come to pass? You just don't have enough faith. Why is your life not going the way you want it? Pray about it. Move the mountain. You see someone suffering? Move the mountain. That's not what the text means. The text, in context, is Jesus coming in and going, Right. We are about to start praying for religion to go. We are about to start praying for decreation so that new creation can come. You see this temple? You see this fig tree? You see apostate Israel? If you fellas pray for this mountain to be thrown into the sea, 
it will be. They do it. They do it all the way through the book of Acts, in every territory they go to, where they are meeting pagan religion after pagan religion. What are they doing? Praying for the Lord to come in and to decreate the mountain of worship that the people are doing so that the Lord will recreate through his Holy Spirit. Parables go on, which we're not going to have time for this morning. But the reason I go there is to go all the way back to Revelation 18. And to start with verse 21, a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. No, the old covenant is finished. When Jesus Christ came down as a baby, as the bread of life in Bethlehem, in the house of bread, when he took on flesh and kept everything, not one jot or tittle will pass from the old covenant, Jesus Christ, in other words, consumed the old covenant. He ate the old covenant. The old covenant is fulfilled in him. It is fulfilled in Christ. You and I cannot fulfill it. If Paul the Apostle says, the good I want to do and I can't do and the bad I don't want to do, I keep doing continually a wretched man that I am. If Paul the Apostle is doing that, then you and I don't stand a chance. And I don't mean we should be slack here and be like, well, that's it. Let's go on a sunbed and a sun lounger and not think about the Old Covenant and the Ten Commandments because they're beautiful. They're about living the perfect life. And as I've said many times before, if you have a little child here or one of your grandchildren here and you say to them, um, Barry, you should brush your teeth twice a day. Why are you saying that? For your benefit? No, for theirs. For theirs. Do you think it hurts God if you go out and murder? No. Who does it hurt? You. That's what the Ten Commandments are for. They're there to say, it's going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt me, I'm God. It's going to hurt you. And so we see that Christ comes along and does what we cannot do, which is completes, fulfills, consumes the Old Covenant, and then what happens? The New Covenant is cut in his side. The better covenant. The covenant that is everlasting. The covenant that atones, that cleanses the conscience, that gives us the Holy Spirit. And for us, I just want us to go as we are thinking about old to new, as we're thinking about moving mountains into the sea, as we're talking about decreation and recreation, as we're on the cusp of Revelation 19, which is all about, Alleluia, Babylon is gone. Apostate Israel is gone. Bring in the new covenant. Bring in the marriage supper. Bring in the alleluia. I want us just to contemplate in the next few minutes, or several minutes, three points about this entire chapter. And I'm just going to read from verse 21 to 24 again. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, flute players, trumpeters, they will be heard no more in you. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the violence of bridegroom and bride, I'm sorry, and the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the land, and all nations were, be, were deceived by your sorcery. 
and in her was found the blood of the prophets and the blood of the saints and of all who have been slain on the land. As we think about these few verses this morning, really, I want us just to touch on three points to close and to think about. them. The first being that to belong to Christ is to be a new creation. To belong to Christ is to be a new creation. We have just seen, I have just been going on about verse 21, about there being praying and prayer for a mountain to be cast into the sea. And we go, I am applying that to the old covenant era. Lord, will you decreate this so we're no longer under it, to recreate it so we're under something new and better? And the Lord says, yes, I sent my son for this very reason. And to be a new creation is to be new, is to be new. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he turns around and says to each one of us this morning, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. There is a tension that you and I need to understand about being in the new covenant. To belong to Christ is to be a new creation, which means that you are 100% holy now. And I know that you sit there and you think, no, I don't feel that way. I feel like I am a sinner. I feel like the weight of the world is too much. I feel like I just can't breathe at times. I just want to escape the pressures. And to tell you the truth, Matt, I don't even really want to send that text message. I don't even want to have to go to this event. I don't really have to want to do this thing. And you go, no. Because as a previous preacher has once said, though we are new creations, the old man inside us is like a cat with nine lives. He just won't lie down and die. Except it's not nine lives. It's not even 99 lives. It's how many times, O oh Lord, do I need to forgive my brother? endlessly how many times Lord I've forgiven him seven times already endlessly that seems like a quite a quite a lot to do Lord yeah endlessly how many times am I going to forgive you guys endlessly under the old covenant that isn't there in the new covenant it is there by the blood of Christ and you are 100% a sinner now and 100% a child of God now. And you go, Lord, this is so confusing. And the Lord just smiles and says, trust me and go to my son. Go to my son. To belong to Christ for us this morning is to be a new creation. And the, the, the old, which is thrown into the sea, the old covenant that is cast into the darkness. No longer the bride. Because the bride is through Christ. We come to Christ. What have you done with my son? To be in Christ is to be a new creation. Second, to belong to Christ. For us to know that every sin can be atoned for. 
for us to know the hope of the blessedness of Christ means that we should make song and worship. Just look with me at verse 22 and 23. Babylon, the great city, has thrown down with violence. I'm taking this to be Jerusalem in Revelation 18. Verse 21, I'm taking this to be Jerusalem in first principles. And then you get verse 22 and 23, which is all, which is talking all about worship. Which is talking all about stewarding. Verse 22, and the sound of harpists and musicians, flute players, trumpeters, they're no longer heard in you. Craftsmen of any craft, they're, they're no longer found in you. The sound of the meal will be heard in you no longer, and the, the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. You hear all of this language and you go, that sounds like old covenant Israel. That sounds like you were to be the light to the world. And that's true. And in the first century throughout your Gospels, you see those who were Jewish under the old covenant who came and saw the Messiah who came to bow down at the Messiah's feet and they said, Alleluia, what a saviour. And Christ said, here, take my robe upon you. You are washed in my blood. You are one of mine. Because all of these things here, all of these attributes here mentioned about worship, about skill, is about how God sees it. And God says, I only see those who are in Christ. I only see those who are in Christ. One question, what have you done with my son? What are you doing with my son? Do you love my son? I sent my son to save you. What have you done with him? We don't want him. Fine. Nothing will be heard anymore. I used to hear. I used to hear under the old covenant, but my son has consumed the old covenant. My son came down as the bread of life. And in his side was cut the new everlasting covenant that atones for your sins for eternity. What have you done with my son? And so to belong to Christ for us this morning, we can take all of these negatives and say, no, no. We can rejoice. We can be good stewards. Good stewards of music, of time, of reading, finances, whatever. Instead of it being in you will be found no more. No, because you're in Christ Jesus. Alleluia, what a saviour. How are you and I worshipping the Lord this morning? How are we worshipping him tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? And we do that, why? Because we're a new creation. And we're going to see this more as we get to Revelation 19, where the rejoicing is just alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. But here we have the hard work of there being decreation. And this verse 23 ends with, For your merchants were the great ones of the land, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. Again, what was the, the purpose of Israel in the old covenant to be a lamp, a light to the nations? That was their purpose. I have made you my covenant keepers to go and be a lamp to the world. Okay, you're not going to do it. I will send my only begotten. What are you going to do with him? Crucify him. May his blood be on us and our children. Finally, Finally belong to Christ is to be a new creation. To belong to Christ should make us sing and worship, to be good stewards. But also, to belong to Christ makes you and I holy. I have touched on this already. But it makes you and I holy. 
in a way that you and I can't quite understand, as I've already touched on. But you and I are holy if we belong to Christ because of two things. Just look with me at verse 24. And in her, again I'm taking this her to be apostate Israel, apostate Jerusalem, leading up to the destruction of AD 70, was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints. And again, there were no more prophets today. Jesus Christ was the last prophet. And of all who have been slain on the land. And again, the concept being that Jesus brings up, when he's talking to the religious leaders in Matthew 23, you lot are like your fathers who killed Abel. And you go, like your fathers who killed Abel. You're like Cain. And there's two things that are very interesting for us to finish on as we talk about holiness. To belong to Christ is to be given the Holy Spirit who makes you holy. He makes you holy 100% the moment you are born again from a positional sanctification. And then you and I throughout our walk in life are supposed to progress in our sanctification. Which means that we are 100% a Christian. And yet as we walk through this world, we are supposed to get less dust and dirt on our feet. That is what it means. And Ephesians chapter 1 tells you and I about the Holy Spirit being given to us. To be in Christ Jesus is to be given the Holy Spirit who seals us, who washes us clean in the blood of Christ, who redeems us. And what does it mean to be sealed by the Holy Spirit? It means to be given a wedding ring. That is what it means. To be given the Spirit of God the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of Christ, is to be given a wedding ring, which is unbreakable. It is unbreakable. And he seals us and says, you're married to Christ now. And every day of your life, as you walk through this world, the Holy Spirit is convicting us of our sin, and we're trying to say to him, leave us alone, because of the old nature fighting against him continuously, and yet he is saying the same thing to us time and time again. Go to Christ. Go to Christ. Go to your husband. You are married to me. You're married to Christ. Go to, go to him. He has the remedy. He has the cure. He's the one who says, come under my wing. Come under my wing. I will look after you. I will nurture you. I will take care of you. Go to him. And so to belong to Christ makes you holy because you're given the Holy Spirit. And that also means, as we read in verse 24, that your life is also holy. And that means your blood is holy. Your blood is holy. When you go back to your old covenant and you get the tabernacle and you get God saying, do not bring me a spoiled offering. Make a separation. That is what holiness is about. Separation. It is about being set apart. Do not bring me this crippled lamb, this spotted lamb. Get me a purebred to sacrifice. Why? Because its blood is holy. I'm going to show you what this looks like and means. So when I send my son Jesus Christ, you will understand. Christ's blood is holy. And so if you are married to Christ, that then means you have the Holy Spirit, which means the blood in your veins this morning is holy. You have holy blood. And in her was found the blood 
of the prophets and the saints and all who had been slain. And when you go all the way back to Genesis with Cain and Abel, you find these most stunning words about what the Lord says to Cain after he gives Cain a chance to repent. Where's, where's, where's your brother? And Cain's like, I do it. Why are you asking me? No, that's your moment to repent, Cain. Verse 10 of chapter 4. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Take that in. Take that in. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And the book of Revelation is all about what happens to Christians who are martyred for their testimony of Jesus Christ. How long, O oh Lord, how long? And God says, I'm listening. I hear your blood. Your blood is holy not because of you, but because you belong to my son. His blood is holy. He's the righteous one. He's the one who's glorious. And so to close, that leaves us with a challenge. Because the challenge is verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it, threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. The challenge that we close with is who are we worshipping? What are we worshipping? Do we have sins that need to be cast into the sea? Do we have Fears that need to be cast into the sea? Do we have doubts that need to be cast into the sea? Do we believe that our blood is holy? Do we believe that we are sealed with a wedding ring of the Holy Spirit who is unbreakable to us? Who says, yes, you're a sinner, but you're 100% a child of God now. Do we believe that? The challenge for us is to be working through and going, Dear Heavenly Father, will you cast the sins of my heart into the sea? Dear Heavenly Father, will you have mercy on me, a sinner? And as we look around the world and we see all sorts of fascinating things, it leaves us with another challenge to close with. Jesus' disciples are told if you go around and you start praying for the Lord to decreate false religion, to decreate false establishments, to set up Christ as king, it will come to pass if you have faith. And they do it. And your book of Acts tells us that the disciples go out into all these pagan territories. They're in Jerusalem. They're praying for repentance for Jerusalem. They're also praying. If not, these things are coming on this generation. They are praying, Lord, forgive this person. But if not, and that means for you and I, as we look at the world around us today, trying to burn itself down. We are in a, a, a wonderful position to be praying for decreation, to be praying for recreation. That is why Christ came, to decreate every single one of us, to recreate us, to give us a new heart, a new mind, so that we will worship Him, to belong to Christ is to be a new creation, which means we should sing, which means we should worship, which means that we are holy. Your blood is holy. You are holy. If we belong to Christ. And with that, let us just close in prayer, and then we will come before the Lord's table. Dear Heavenly Father, we think on these very difficult and challenging concepts, Lord about being a new creation. And Father, we confess to you that 
We don't feel like we're new. We feel tired and old. We feel battered and bruised. We feel joyless at times. Father, we feel like um, all we can do is uh, sin. The good we wish to do, we don't do. The evil we don't wish to do, we do continuously. And there is no health in us, O Lord. And yet, Father, we thank Thee that through the finished work of your Son, we can be your children. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be like infants, worshipping you, thanking you, rejoicing in you. And Father, we pray that you will help each one of us cast the sin of our lives into the sea. Remove, Lord, the the bits of us that get in the way. Recreate us, Father, to be the, the children that you wish us to be. And we thank thee, O Lord, that we can pray to you this morning, knowing that we are 100% sinners and 100% yours. Father, in Christ we are holy. And we pray, Lord, that you will teach us this. And teach us, Lord, that he came and fulfilled the old covenant and brought in the new. Help us, Lord, to see your old covenant in its true glory, fulfilled in Christ. Help us, Lord, not to be like a false bride. Help us, Lord, to belong to Christ and to rejoice, saying, Alleluia, what a Saviour. Help us, Lord, to come under the shadow of his wing. Help us, Lord, to know that he is our shield and our defender, our sword, our champion, our king, our priest, our prophet, our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we ask your blessing now as we come before the Lord's table. Remove our sin, Lord, cast it into the sea. Fill our hearts, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Help us to taste and sup and see the richness of Christ, the goodness of our Saviour, the Messiah. The old has passed, the new is permanent. Heavenly Father, help us to be new creations. Renew our minds, renew our hearts, set us upon our feet yet again. We pray this, Lord, and we beg thee for thy mercy. Hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.